Hey folks, my name is Kevin and it is time for a little bit more knife nerdery. And today we're going to be taking a small details look at the prototype of an upcoming knife called Ari from a new boutique brand called Kalem Blade Designs. Now, if you've not heard that name yet, that's because this is the first knife design from a guy named Kevin Zhang. And the pre-order for this is coming up sometime around mid-September. I know I've heard plenty of folks express fatigue over this new wave of quote-unquote designer knives that have been brought on by OEMs dramatically lowering the barrier to entry for first-time knife designers. And I hear you. I agree. There's a lot of bland and poorly thought-out knives being pitched as pre-orders these days from enthusiasts who think they can now give the title knife designer a shot. My personal take is I will gladly wade through a sea of shitty knives if it means that folks like Kevin can bring incredibly well done designs like this to market. Or for that matter, folks like Asher Knives being able to bring the whole Spiro or TW Price being able to bring the Dawn. These are incredibly well done knives, incredibly well thought out knives that simply wouldn't be able to exist if it weren't for this type of OEM market. And for that matter, there's brands like Quiet Carry that are at this point significantly more established, but these started the exact same way. Bryce is not a knife maker and he doesn't have a production facility here in the States. Bryce is a knife designer and a spectacular knife designer and he, Quiet Carry as a brand wouldn't exist if it weren't for this same kind of OEM model. So what I'm hoping to show you today is that this Ari is another one of those very well thought out knives worth supporting. I know this in part because I got to spend the last few months chatting with Kevin about the design before the prototypes were made. We discussed a ton of little design details and I got to suggest a bunch of small things to pay attention to or to tweak. But the truth is the state of this design when he first showed it to me was already exceptionally well thought out. A lot of our conversation ended up being things like, oh, cool, I really like how you did X, or did you make sure to do Y? Yeah, awesome, great, that kind of thing. Now, there were a few changes that I suggested that he did communicate to QSP, that's the OEM here, uh, but they didn't seem to make it into this prototype. And now that I have in hand, there are a few more things that I'm going to suggest changing uh, before the production models. And I want to be very clear about that up front. I'm going to be hyper nitpicky in this video, specifically because this is a prototype. Changes can be made, and that is exactly what Kevin asked of me. But I don't want to give you the wrong impression, because even though I'm going to be saying things could be different here, and maybe in some cases should be different, this knife, exactly as it is today, is already an exceptionally well thought out, exceptionally well made knife. This knife, as exactly as it is, if nothing else was changed, this knife is fantastic. Now let's back up a little bit here. So I said Kalem Blade Designs is the moniker for a guy named Kevin Zhang. Kalem itself means sky or the heavens in Latin. He's going with the sky interpretation, um, and there's a general kind of sky theme with everything here. Uh, he said that his motto through all of this is the sky is the limit, and I, I, I find that a little bit hokey, but it's cute. And I do love that he's actually kind of pushing the boundaries and stuff. Like the way that he's doing this I guess reverse bolster lock is, I think, novel. I don't think anyone's really done this before, and it's a it's a clever way of doing it. We'll talk about why that's actually good later. Uh, Ari means eagle in Old Norse and Scandinavian languages, which again ties into the sky theme, and it's also the nickname of his firstborn son. I think his name is Arlen. I love that familial tie-in, and, and also just the kind of sky tie-in. And you can see that the logo here is this cool picture of these clouds. It's really, really pretty looking, and it's engraved in this really cool way on the pivot. So I just, I think there's good brand cohesiveness. Uh, Kevin is a longtime uh, knife enthusiast and collector. He's been in the hobby for about a decade now, and his background in drafting means that he was able to sketch this all up in CAD very naturally and easily. And it meant that the process of talking with him about the little details here was actually really, really cool and really, really easy. Because not only was like, for, for example, I'll talk about this later, but the clearance here of this as you go around the top of that, when I asked about that, he was able to manipulate the CAD drawing and show me exactly how this passed is over and we could discuss all of that in, in really easy detail. It also meant that when I did suggest a change, he was able to sketch that up very easily and pass it off to QSP. And so it was cool just to see that kind of turnaround. It was, it was, it was a really fun process. And I, I huge, huge thank you to Kevin for letting me be involved in any of that. Now let's talk about the aesthetics of this knife because I think it's a really strong part. And one of the things that drew me to it when Kevin first showed it to me, I think this is just an incredibly gorgeous, sleek design. A lot of these first time designer knives that are coming on the market right now are really bland and look like something you've seen a million times. It makes me scratch my head and wonder why someone feels that they need to bring this to the market. What is it providing that's not out there already? 
or they're really kind of weird looking. They look like some kind of novelty or they just have things in shapes and positions and orientations and stuff makes you go like, are you, are you sure that it should be that way? And that's not the case here at all. This just has such nice balance and flow to it. The lines here are so beautiful. And there's, there's, there's elements that call out other elements that I think just ties it all together very, very nicely. We've got this long continuous swoop at the top, a flat spot, and then a swoop at the back. And that of course is ergonomic when how it fits in your hand, but it just flows so well. We've got this prominent bolster at the top. We'll talk about that more in a second, but the shapes here are just really, really cool. The, the fact that it is an in over slash inlay at the front of the knife instead of the back itself is a cool aesthetic you don't see elsewhere. But then the, the shapes here again kind of echo other stuff. So let's look at this pivot again. I talked about the logo being engraved, but check out this line that goes around it that calls out to this little swoop at the back. Now that is such a cool shape around there for a pivot collar, and which is effectively what this is. I think it's part of the handle itself that this is then placed around instead of a standalone piece, but man, it looks neat. And at first glance, it actually kind of reminded me of like the Flash's logo if you're a DC Comics nerd, but yeah, I love the way that looks. And that line there is mirrored back here in this point very intentionally. So this hole has a uh, uh, like a pill shape at the top, but then comes with a, a flowing chamfer down to this uh, little point at the tip. and. Then that also mirrors that, but is also then reflected here on the clip. Like this, these chamfers here in this flow is exactly the same as that. It's just, it's just a really, really wonderful callback. At the blade, we've got a similar kind of swoop to a point that is just, oh man, it looks so nice on this version. This, uh, the carbon fiber versions have this satin blade finish and it is gorgeous. Now it's not quite as prominent of uh, grind lines is something you'll find from Ria. Ria is known for their very prominent grind lines, but check this out. Like this is, this QSP is getting pretty close here on this knife. Now, I don't know how well I'll be able to get this to focus with light on it. Come on. Right there, you can see the grind lines on this swedge are angled slightly at an upward direction, which gives it a contrasting texture. And then the flats are hand satin running that way. And it's just beautiful transitions here with these three delightful tones that kind of catch the light in different ways. I love it. And there's also very crisp transitions between these, which is really, really nice to see. I normally am a user finished person and there my Carter versions of this come in a full stone wash, or at least that's the plan. And I, I normally would go for something like that, but this knife is so beautiful. And I think that this finish up here works so well with the overall aesthetic that especially with these carbon fibers, man, I think that's the one to go for. Now, when the knife is closed, it also has really nice flow. Some knives look great open, but look really, really stupid closed. And I love the way this works. He's also doing something with this front flipper tab where it has enough, it's sticking up enough that it gives you the ability to push correctly. We're gonna talk about that later, but it doesn't stick up front of the, of the knife. And so it's not this kind of thing where the flipper tab looks stupid. It, like, it looks nice and it echoes this kind of spot here. Overall, I just think this knife looks so darn good. Sometimes when you have little kind of pointy things like this, you worry that they're going to feel bad in your hand. Like maybe they're gonna suck if it pushes in or maybe it's gonna suck to push right there or something like that. And no, everything about this just flows so nice and soft. Uh, QSP did a spectacular job on the finishing of this. All of these edges are very nice and soft and the overall thing, it just feels so good. Now this, we'll talk, uh, the elephant in the room is that this is a big knife. It's, it's, it's a big knife and I have medium glove size hands. So it's, it's not that it's a huge knife. It's only 3.6 inches. It's just much bigger than I normally go for. And part of it is that the handle is very full size. So it's a 3.6 inch blade but a 5.16 inch handle. Part of that is that I'm measuring out to this top point right there. And so it's not like you're really going to be having your hand up there, but this is just a much bigger knife than I normally go for, but it still feels so good in my hand. And when I try to emulate where other people might land if they have bigger hands than me, oh, it still just feels great. Let's talk about this inlay a little bit more. This is really, really cool. So on most knives, the inlay is going to be somewhere further back, or it's going to be on a frame lock. It's going to be not on the show side, I mean, the lock side whatsoever. But this, what's doing here is, is something that I think is honestly potentially novel, or at least very, very uncommon. We have basically an inverse bolster lock. A bolster lock, let me grab literally any bolster lock. 
So this is the EMP EDC thick boy. And the way that this works, a, the way a bolster lock in general works, is that it's it's kind of like a frame lock. It starts as what would be a frame lock. It's got one continuous piece of titanium that goes the entire way around. And then a portion towards the back has been cut away and an overlay has been placed on top. The result is that the lock bar, what would have been a thick frame lock lock bar, is thinned out and acts at, at least on the back portion, just like a liner lock, but it's all one continuous piece of metal. The impact is at the end is that you have the metal exposed at the top, which looks like a traditional bolster on like a fixed blade knife. Now over here, we've got the opposite. The, the bolster is not the metal, but the overlay itself. It's blocking the top portion of this. And what you have instead is the full frame lock extending up. It's not thinned out until you get up into there, this top portion. And so this has the behavior much more like a standard frame lock, but with all of the same benefits of a bolster lock about blocking your access to this bar, which means you don't have to worry about lock bar pressure. It's a really clever way of doing it. And we'll talk all about that more when we get into the actual deployment, but it's just, it's just so cool. And no one, no one does this. Now the bolster itself sticks up slightly proud. Um, I, f I measured this, but I forget exactly how much more it is. It's three tenths of an inch above. And that's not originally the plan. Kevin wanted this to be flush, but QSP said that if they did make it flush, it would make the material too thin here. And they were worried about it being fragile. Now the end result is actually really kind of cool. I don't normally want uh, inlays or overlays to stick up proud, but this does it in a very intentional way and it has an additional chamfer on the outside. And because it is at the front up here, it just feels kind of neat. I like having this slight additional weight in my hand. I mean, the not thickness in my hand at the front and it, yeah, it just, it feels intentional, even though it wasn't originally the plan. Now this particular material is a copper infused carbon fiber and it just looks so freaking cool. It's something that QSB has been using recently and I love the way this looks. You can also see it on um, some of QSB's knives but also on like the Devo knives stout for example. It's also going to be available in an aluminum infused carbon fiber and also to my Carter versions, a black and an OD green. Now let's talk for a moment about how you make this material because it's so freaking neat. Normal like woven carbon fiber, the way it's done is they take uh, carbon fiber strands and weave them together in a, in a standard weaving pattern. And they take those sheets of that and they layer them with uh, resin in between and then they compress it under heat and pressure and becomes this stacked layer material. If you have something like uh, shred carbon fiber or uh, marble carbon fiber, what they're doing is using either the individual strands, the, the threads of carbon fiber itself, or little patches, uh, little, little chunks of that carbon fiber weave, and they're randomly distributing it in a sea of resin and kind of swirling it all around. And how much swirl and what the ratio of that is going to change the look and feel of the thing. Now with something like this, what they're doing is doing the same thing as they would do with uh, like, a, like a, a marble carbon fiber, but they're taking those little patches of carbon fiber weave and they're laying that around randomly with thin layers of copper or aluminum foil in between. And since those, those pieces of carbon fiber patches are uh, randomly distributed and they have different heights to them, when they then compress it down, the, the copper is pressed down around those to, and to fill in the gaps around them. And the overall thing, when you then cut it flat, has these peaks and crests and tops and waves and everything like that, where you can see the different layers. And it's, it's so, it's like, it, it's like if you took uh, a topographical map, but then flex the entire thing so that the topographical part is actually happening midway through the material. And one of the things that's really cool about the fact that it sticks up is that you can actually see the cross cut side of it as you go. And if this was flat, you wouldn't get to see that. And it's just, it's just such a cool look. Can I see some good pots, spots right there? Oh yeah. Yeah, that's a really good view. Look at that. It's just so cool looking. So let's start talking about this blade. It's an S90V, and that in itself is pretty cool to see. It's very common these days to find a titanium frame lock knife in M390. And so it's fun to get to see another kind of super steel out there that's just out of the ordinary. Some people don't like S90V because it's not for them. Some people love it. S90V is a steel that it, it, when heat treated correctly has very, very high edge retention. And so this is meant to be a slicing knife meant for regular cutting and not necessarily a hard to use knife because S90V 
is, you know, tends to be at that high hardness, tends to be a little bit more brittle. Now, I'm not a metallurgist, and I'm also not doing an extensive amount of testing on this. Um, this knife is going to be headed to Jared Neves after this, and so he'll probably tell you a little bit more his thoughts on this particular heat treat. But I personally like S90V a lot, and because my kind of EDC is that regular slicing of things like tape, cardboard, uh, and, and paper. And that, that's the most common stuff that I cut, and that's what S90V is kind of perfect for. This blade shape itself is really, really aesthetically beautiful, but it's not my particular favorite blade shape. I don't love when there is a pronounced amount of belly at the front of a blade, but I don't mind it. See, the thing is, is when you have a like kind of a, a fat belly all at the tip, you have to curve your hand up more in order to get at that tip. And I very frequently use the tip for cutting. But what I do find is actually on blades like this, I often can get away with just using this front part. It's not quite as precise, but for the kind of stuff that I'm doing, I usually can just use that and cut along the top of the box just with that edge. And we do have a lot of flat at the front, which is uh, at the back back here, I mean, which is uh, really nice for kind of chopping tasks, but it also means that you, it's, um, a knife with a lot of belly, I sometimes find that I slide out of the cut as I go because as I'm cutting along, the the, the material wants to slide up that sh that curve and out. But the, having this amount of flat back here means that it's really easy to stay in the cut as you're pushing through. We've got overall a uh, 0.136 inch blade stock. That's just shy of uh, three and a half millimeters. And so it's not thick blade stock. It's actually you know, it's it's not thin either, but I think it's thin for the size of this knife. Like everything has been scaled up just slightly. And so overall, I don't mind seeing this blade stock in this way whatsoever. It comes to a reasonably sturdy tip though. Like look at this. That's not that dainty little thing that you might find on some other knives that have a blade that's thinning out this long. And the swedge is kind of thinning it out, but you can also see that like the flat line right there as you come up, it's, you know, it's not dipping super far below that. So it's only thinning out really kind of at this last little bit, and it's going to be the full thickness all the way up to here on the blade. This, the swedge does not come in too far though. This is one of my things that my nitpicks about swedge on the tops of blades is usually the angle of them is too aggressive inward, leaving too narrow of a spot at the top. So you combine the angle of this wedge with the thickness of this blade stock, and you actually have a lot of nice material here if you want to have this in a pinch cut and be able to put your finger on the back. You can put a lot of force into it, and I really, really like that. This tip is, like I said, isn't dainty, and so I, like, I don't expect you to be prying, especially with S90V, but especially with S90V, it's nice to see some meat behind the dip so this top part doesn't isn't too chippy or, or worried about breaking off. The grind itself is uh, you know 0.7 inches high and so on a blade this thick you want a tall enough grind that it has time to thin out and makes this a slicey knife and they've done a pretty good job here. Now I measured this at 22 thousandths behind the edge and so it's not that thin but that's about what you'd expect from this kind of blade stock and when I talked to Kevin he said that rather than asking for a specific uh, thickness behind the edge, he asked for a specific edge angle. He wanted this to be a 17 degree edge. And what you'll find often, because companies these days have, have learned that thickness behind the edge has become a trendy kind of topic to talk about, that they'll end up uh, putting a thicker and th uh, like a wider and wider and wider angle on the actual bevel itself up to like 30, 35 degrees, because by doing that, they're changing the contact point of where it hits on the ends on the blade. And so they're extending that behind the edge point by making it further down. That's cheating, and it's not what you want. Uh, the reality is, 22 thousandths behind the edge with a 17 degree edge angle is is a very good combination for a slicing knife. In fact, that's what you'll find on slicing knives like TRM. They have 22 thousandths behind the edge and a 17 degree edge angle. The big difference between those knives and this is that the overall thickness is just thinner. Now let's talk about how this cuts as a result. So I always say that I, you know, I try to push these things through cardboard and I try to, I keep every single double walled cardboard box that ever crosses my way because I use it for these types of tests. I don't often bring them out and show them because it's just kind of, I forget to do it. It's just kind of a pain to, to not just throw it away in the recycling immediately. But I wanted to show you what kind of cutting you'll get. So on this is thin enough that this still actually gives you very nice, clean cuts. There's no ripping, there's no tearing. This was able to push through easily. But what you will find is that there's slight angularity. So this is slightly at an angle this way instead of perfectly flat like that. And that's not me twisting my hand to the side. What that is, uh, is the material having to twist 
slightly, ever so slightly, to make room. With the whole point of double walled cardboard as a test is that it's a material that doesn't splay easily this way. The extra layer of, card of corrugation means that it doesn't want to bend this direction. It has to bend one of these types of directions. And so to accommodate this kind of blade stock, it has to bend slightly this way. And so the entire material wants to twist slightly. But this is thin enough that we have barely any twisting whatsoever. But as a contrast, let's see this piece. This is something I cut with the TRM shadow, and that is 0.09 blade stock, but again with that same 22,000 pound the edge and 17 degree edge angle. And the difference here is that it is much, much flatter, much, much straighter. It's completely clean up and down. The actual edges itself though, I mean, look, that's a very nice crisp edge. The edge on this is wicked sharp. They did a great job at the Preto shop. But the other thing I wanted to show you is look at this curve here. So now when I pushed through this on this piece, I deliberately wasn't working super hard to keep my hand locked in this direction. I let it kind of sway a little bit as I went. And the extra resistance you get from slightly thicker blade stock causes more resistance and makes it easier for your blade to kind of wobble as you go. And I was maybe being a little bit exaggerating here, but you can see that it wobbled as I went. Now I tried to use the exact same amount of grip strength on the TRM shadow and look how clean and straight this line is. It's just easier to keep it in line because there's less resistance. But I want to, I don't want to say that, you know, I don't want to give you the impression that this is bad because this is actually a really great result. I do this all the time. Anytime I do one of these multi tools reviews, I'm doing these kinds of, um, dual double walled cardboard tests. And this is actually a very, very nice result. This, this knife is actually a very fantastic slicer. It's not the sliciest knife in the world, but I don't think it's really designed to be. It's a bigger, slightly thicker, slightly heavier knife. And I think, I think it's, it's perfect for what it's trying to do. Now, one of the things that I did talk with him about before this prototype was made that he relayed to them and that didn't get translated is how this plunge grind is being done. I think the curve here is beautiful and it's nice. I always like to see these curved uh, these curved plunges because I think it's, it's a little bit harder to do, but I think it's just a really nice aesthetic choice. We can also see that it lines up perfectly with this hole here. And so I think all that works great, but the end back here is not quite what you want. Now the plunge grind is the thing that's taking from the full thickness to the thinnest behind the edge. And so it's going to be this swoop down. And one of the things that we addressed is trying to pull it and tighter back up or shift the entire thing back slightly so that you don't have what we're seeing right here. This is a smile. You can see that on this prototype, the plunge is ending not just at the edge, but slightly in front of the edge. So right from the factory, the bevel grind itself has no choice but to swoop up as the material thickens and become slightly thicker and taller at the end. And so every time you sharpen this, it's going to get thicker and thicker and thicker. Now, like I said, this is something that he's already talked to QSP about. And so I'm not sure why it didn't end up in the prototype because he talked to them about it before they put the prototypes into production, but hopefully it's something that they'll be able to do on the actual final versions because I know it's something that he cares about. The other thing that didn't get translated or got lost in translation is this little tip right Right here. Now, if let me put something to there, you can see. You can see that this just comes and sticks straight out. Now it follows this curve, so it's not straight, straight out, but it means that this back corner right here is a little bit sharp. And so while this isn't a full finger toil, if you do find yourself up here, that is the kind of thing that can give you a little bit of a puncture cut at the tip. And so one of the things that I told him to to, to have changed is to have this top, just this, this angle here extended out slightly and to have that tip cut off. Now, again, that's something that he commuted to USB, but it didn't show up in this prototype. Now at the top of the knife, we've got jimping and where it falls in the open position is is I think in a really, really good spot. Now it's going to depend on where you hold this and how your hand fits on this. For me, my hand fits perfectly in this little spot right there. And so that puts this, my thumb right where that jimping is. If I choke up, then I'm past it. And so like, if your hand is really big, you all be up past it too. If I choke back all the way to the very end of the knife, I can still catch the tens of this jimping right there. And this jimping is one of my favorite kinds of jimping. It's the kind that is crisp and sharp, but it has wide flat spots and is relatively shallow. And the end result of all of this is that it catches my fingers immediately. I think it gives me really good traction, but it doesn't hurt at all to press on. Now I did talk about the fact that the handle has really nice uh, kind of curves and rounded and smoothness to these transitions on these bevels. My one complaint about the top here is that this edge right here is a little bit crisp and sharp and feels a little bit unfinished. Let me look at uh, another knife that's doing a, like a slightly better job. So this is the Maverick S from Riot. It's a Christensen Knife Works, and they also have a top swedge right here. And you'd think that this top would be the same, but 
It's not that there's like a chamfer here per se, they've just ever so slightly knocked this down to the point where we're running my finger over this, this isn't scrapey. And this, by contrast, is scrapey. Now on some knives, like survival-y type knives, you want a crisp edge there, so you can use it on like a fire rod or something. On this, I wouldn't want that. Uh, and I, again, I'm not saying they should add an entire complete chamfer here. Just knock this ever so slightly back. Meanwhile, the hole itself that you use for opening has a really nice chamfer that runs the entire length. And this is actually not crisp at all. So I find that in some knives, especially knives with a satin finish, that if I run my finger out of this, because this is, you know, when I'm flicking, I, I often flick with the nail of my finger instead of the meat of my finger, and that it'll scrape up my nail. And this doesn't scrape whatsoever. I love the inside of this. It feels absolutely fantastic. And on the stonewashed versions of these blades, all of these edges, everything I'm talking about is going to be knocked down. My hope, because I haven't held on those, is that they're doing the jimping after that stonewashing so that these edges are still nice and crisp. It might not be. One of the people that have one of these already uh, was Jim Skelton. And if you watch his video, he talks about the jimping not being super duper grippy. So my concern is that maybe they did it in the wrong order. And if that's the case, that's something I want them to fix on the production versions. Now let's talk about this in various grips. So again, Elf in the Room, bigger, much, much bigger knife than I would ever pick up, especially from a hand perspective. But my medium glove size hands fall into this part right here absolutely perfectly. So the reality is, is even for me, even though this is a much bigger knife than I'm used to, this feels so good and comfortable in my hand. Now, what I'm not sure is if the average person with larger hands than me, if they would keep their forefinger at the same spot and come back and wrap down over this, or if they would keep their pinky in the same spot and come up and wrap up over this. Either way, it actually feels really, really nice. None of these are hard or sharp, and this curvature back here is something that you can easily roll off if your hand is enormous. But <clears throat> this handle would certainly accommodate much, much, much bigger hands than mine, but still works so nicely for mine. If I choke up, it's also quite comfortable, and I, I actually used this grip for a lot of the cutting that I did in my testing. Now, one of the consequences of my hand being back here in its natural grip is that I'm a little bit far away from the edge. I'm used to cutting things with the material being right in front of my finger and kind of coming in like this, and so here I had to be further back like that. Now, if I'm choked up, it's different, but this is my natural grip, and so yeah, that made me feel a little bit far away from the edge. But again, that's something you'd get used to very easily if this was a knife you were using on a regular basis. The overall curves here, like I mentioned, fit really, really nicely in a pinch grip. So if you are choked like here with your thumb on the pivot, and then your fingers wrapping right here, you anchor against this back spot with your pinky, and this feels very locked in, very, very nice. Now in my hands, this back isn't sticking out entirely, but if I choke back and have my my, my ring finger pressed against that and have this in the palm of my hand. Now, I wouldn't personally use this because this is such a long knife that this is putting the tip very far from my hands. So I wouldn't hold in this grip, but this is emulating what it might be for, for someone with much bigger, like XL size hands and where it would fall. And this feels fantastic too. All of these back spots are so nicely rounded. I just, I just love the way the finishing has been done here. And these overall curves, Nothing is sharp. I love it. It's so well done. Now, lock bar access up here has been done with both a recessed part and a scallop. This is one of the things that I actually, I think is a little bit odd. I noticed this in the designs when you're just showing me the CADs and the models and everything like that, but I feel like this corner here is a little bit weird. When I when I go to open the knife, I find that you know the, the, the scallop wants me to press right here, but my hand often naturally finds like the, the tallest part that I can press on. And so I often find myself pressing all the way up here uh, almost on accident. And it's it's that I don't need to be pressing on this corner. Why am I pressing on a corner? I you don't need to. You, I shouldn't be doing that, but I find that I keep doing it. So what I would probably personally do is either extend this scallop a little bit further so that it lines up here and I'm pressing against a flattened spot instead of this edge, or I would just push this entire part forward so that it lines up with this curve, or just pull that back and make it so that all you have is the scallop and not have this, this uh, kind of difference here. I don't, I don't really see a lot of value in having this corner exposed, and I kind of wish it wasn't there. Because with the scallop and the recession here, this is plenty of lock bar access. It's very, very easy to open this knife. Now, one of the things that I would ask him to change, and it's something that I did mention, and I think it just kind of got lost, is that I would want there to be a small chamfer right here on this edge, because right now, this is one, like, this honestly, is the only sharp part. And this corner 
is very, very sharp. And so it's not the kind of thing that you're normally ever pressing on, but if you are choked up, you can kind of run your finger against it and feel it. Like, yeah, that's sharp right there. It It's it's in the middle. And so that's something I hope he does, is have a little chamfer right there. Now, one of the things, the reasons why that's actually a problem is because he has this kind of cutaway right here. You'll see on the Dawn that I showed at the beginning of this, he doesn't have that same problem because this all lines up just flush. But the reason for this little cutaway right there is because it makes that follow this path right here and stay parallel with this line. If they, if he didn't have that cutaway, if he just left this keep going straight out, then that edge would be much closer to the top and you would catch it on this side instead. And that's one of my, my pet peeves and eyes is if you rub your finger over the front and it catches on the, the lock little face right there and is, is sharp. So it's really nice to see this, uh, though I think I want to see the little chamfer right there to kind of solve the problem on the other side as well. But otherwise, this is really, really delightful. There's a nice little chamfer right there. All of these spots are nice and rounded. And so the actual like experience of pressing against this, it feels really, really good. The overall handle thickness is a little bit on the thicker size, but again, not for the overall size of the knife. Everything is scaled to feel appropriate. The handles themselves are just shy, like 0.499, just shy of half an inch thick. And that's, again, that's not thick per se, but it, it's it's getting on the thicker side for an EDC knife. But again, it just makes sense for this overall size. Now, once you come up to the bolster part, that's a little bit thicker, this is now 0.567. And what you're left with is something that I think honestly just feels really, really good in my hand. I'm so used to these very thin, tall knives these days because of all the things like TRM that I carry. So something in this size, especially for the overall size of the knife, it just, yeah, feels great. I love the way this overall sits in my hand. Now, I'm not usually a fan of flat slab scales, and that's generally speaking what we have here, but we've got really nice chamfers the entire way, and so this doesn't feel, uh, I don't know, often flat slab scales have sharp edges or just feel like kind of a brick in my hand, and this thing is flow, this thing flows well enough and has curves in the right spots and thins out enough in this way that I just, I didn't ever have that problem with this. I never have picked this up and thought like, oh, what is this brick shaped object in my hand? I just, I love the way it fits there. Now in um, a, a, like a choked up pinch grip like this, this, I was worried at first that maybe this sharp corner wouldn't feel good to wrap my fingers around in the kind of chef's knife pinch grip, but this actually works great. My finger still has the ability to curve down right here and then it wraps around on the backside and it just feels really, really good and locked in. The other thing is that because of the combined chamfer of this and the chamfer of that, you have enough of a flow right here that it does feel kind of like a ramp down. I was worried that this would be a significant drop off. This is something that I mentioned in my uh, Devo Knives Stout review that the, having this, the, 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 the abrupt drop off on a thicker scale like this felt like it was just kind of a cliff you're falling off. But these little chamfers and that chamfer there combine to kind of eliminate that problem. Now let's talk about this clip. So I mentioned that the clip aesthetically at the tip mirrors that right there and I absolutely love that. But one of the things that I don't really love is that the clip itself is just straight and yet the back of this knife is curving so significantly. Uh, a suggestion I would have just purely aesthetically would be to make this back part curve as well and have the clip kind of curve up and then straighten back out. I think it just would look better with the overall flow, but I love the unique shape here. And sometimes if you put a point on the end of your clip, that can be bad, but this clip does not hurt me whatsoever. I don't notice it anywhere and I've never once felt that be jabby. Now, I think that the, the clip is the right size for in general. Sometimes they'll put on a bigger knife like this a longer clip, and the problem would be is that suddenly that would make it push into the wrong spots. The, the length of this clip as it is makes it fall, when I'm choked all the way back, it makes it fall right behind this line right here. I looked this up recently, and this is called your distal transverse crease. Yeah, who knows? But the whole point of this is that if a if your clip falls behind it on your hand, this spot is relatively flat and you won't feel it. If it goes in front of that and falls under this pad right here, which I also looked up and is called, I think, your first interdigital volar pad. Yeah, something like that. If it if it lands right there, 
Now that ball right there, suddenly now you'll feel it every single time you squeeze because it's pressing into this part that sticks out. And so I don't want this clip to be any longer, but there does come with a consequence for my size hands when we talk about deployment. We'll get to that in a little bit, but there is a problem with this clip as it is. But you already knows about this. So he's used this tiny little square and you can see it's actually long in this dimension, longer than it is in that dimension. He did that to make this be as deep of carry as he could. The problem with that is that it doesn't lock it in enough to prevent side to side twisting. Like if you actually look at this, this will slide all of this distance. And you can see if I push this over, you see that little shine right there? Let's see, you get that to glow right there. Okay, that's how much this has moved over that much distance. And so he already has addressed this. Now, I, I talked to them about this and the initial thing he said he was thinking of doing is was extending this down and adding a second screw. And I, I encouraged him to instead uh, use, instead of a second external screw, to have a internal locating pin that, that would have the exact same effect, but would allow you to do that in a smaller distance and not have a second screw exposed. So either way, the end result is going to have to mean slightly uh, less deep of carry, but it's definitely going to be a better better end result. Now, one of the other things I was going to suggest, but he's already uh, agreed to do and told QSP is to uh, f create a filler tab right here. Now, I love that he has the inversion of the clip itself, but as is, I definitely wanted that filler because this feels like an empty, missing, incomplete hole. Now, it, because he is going to have to extend this slightly more in order to be able to put the internal pin, it's going to be a slightly bigger filler tab, but I think it's going to blend in quite nicely if you've got the same B-blast finish on here. Now, one of the other things that I would encourage him to do is to see if he can get them to use flatter uh, screw heads or potentially seat them a little bit deeper. I This is such a nice flat smooth surface here with such a nice finish, but I don't like that you can feel these as they stick out. They stick out far enough that it's just kind of cumbersome. If they used a flat head screw instead of a bubble head screw, that would eliminate it. It's even more of a thing up here, and I think that they probably would need to switch to a different screw type rather than uh, recessing it deeper just because of the way that the material thickness is. You can't make this material all that thin, and so as a result, this one sticks up a little bit more, and I just I wish they wouldn't do it. The other thing that I would encourage is them to use a black screw here if they can. It doesn't glow that much. Like I don't really notice it. It gets lost in this and on the version with the aluminum inlay or aluminum infused carbon fiber, I think it would disappear even more. But on all of the versions of this, a black screw here would completely disappear. Now let's talk about the weight of this knife. So this, interestingly, does not feel like a heavy knife to me. I say that's interesting because it's actually heavier than almost anything I have in my collection. This is just shy of five ounces. It's 4.968 ounces. And that is heavy by my standards for what I carry an ADC knife, but with the overall size and layout and, and, and like balance of this knife, it doesn't feel heavy. It never has felt heavy to me. It feels really, really nice. They're pulling that off by having pretty extensive skeletonization throughout. Now, if you look, let me bounce some light up in here. Yeah, you can see there's these big pockets back here. You also see that on the other side, they've got these circles. Now there's no pocketing up front because they can't. What is because this is in fact an inlay. Like if you look right here, you can see how far the carbon fiber comes down into the handle. And so there actually is skeletonization pocketing at the top that's been filled in with a very light material called carbon fiber. So I don't think there's anything that we could do up there, but they could extend this out. So for example, that circle back there could be connected into this, or they could make the uh, connector points between these a little bit narrower. The other thing that they could do is can extend these all together into one big long chamfer. It's not going to be a ton of weight reduction, but it could do a little bit, but that will impact the balance. And right now, the balance I'm going to say is absolutely perfect depending on how you hold this knife. Now for me, like I said, my index finger lines up right here. And so my natural grip is like this, and that puts the balance point exactly where I want it to be. And this feels perfectly balanced. I feel like I have total control of this knife. I love that. Even though it's the larger size, it feels so good. But if you are the type of person that's naturally going to extend upward with your larger hands, or if you just choke up, now the balance point is a little bit back. And so it's not that it feels back heavy at all, but it just is slightly, you can tell that you have more weight at the back. Now that goes into something else that I would like to see, but it would also impact the balance. I feel like this design is so sleek and beautiful that it looks a little bit weird 
to have just barrel spacers back here. I would much prefer aesthetically to have a kind of integrated looking backspacer that flows and matches and maybe has a nice chamfer along it or maybe has some kind of I don't know, striping to match that, something, something along the back. The problem is if you look at how the blade to handle ratio works on here, there's a fair amount of distance back here that you could, well, I mean, technically you could lob off this entire back part. You would change the aesthetics and change the overall shape of the handle. And I don't think he wants to do that. But if you were to try and fill that space in with a backspace here, that's a decent amount of material. If you were to do that, if he, if he tries to go that route at all, I would encourage him to make it a very thin backspacer that's only lining along the top and not filling in this entire back because that would definitely add weight and move the weight balance further back. Now, yeah, you could compensate some by doing those internal milling changes like I mentioned, but realistically, I don't know, this balance point, like I said, is just kind of perfect. Now let's talk about a decision that he made along the way. One of the things when he was talking with QSP, one of the very first things that really jumped out at me when he first showed this to me is the length of this lock bar. Because when he first had this, the lock bar cutaway, this is the lock bar relief, the thing that, that thins the lock bar out and makes it easier to flex, that was on the outside. And it, it was in the exact same spot. So it was up here in front of the clip. And that looked really, really weird to me. I had only seen that on maybe one or two other knives ever and it just it seemed wrong. I couldn't figure out why this lock bar was as short it was. I think what's going on here is that the knife is just has a much longer handle. And so QSP, they're the ones who chose that positioning. He didn't. They said that this is the length, the length of the lock bar they recommended. And so to putting it any further back would make the lock bar too long. So Okay, cool. The way that we solve this is by moving on the inside. So now you don't have anything to worry about there and it also just helps clean up this whole aesthetic. Now, I, I wish that you didn't see this line here, but it kind of does give away the magic of the fact that this is a, still a frame lock underneath. So it's, I don't mind it, but there is unfortunately a consequence of moving things inside that no one ever really talks about. And that I think, so it, I, I'm not 100% positive, but I'm, I'd say I'm 99.9% .9 positive that when they move this inside, they just flipped it internally and they didn't change the positioning. And that's where we're going to go to is you can't do that on a knife that has any kind of slope and chamfer. Um, I happen to still have this. This is the prototype version of the Dawn. Thank you, Tyler, for letting me stay hang on to this for so long. And this is the regular version of the Dawn. And this, he did the exact same thing here. He moved from the prototype to production. He moved the uh, lock bar relief to the inside of the knife. The problem is, is on, on a knife like the Ari or here, if you have any kind of chamfer on the outside, it means that they can't extend that all that far. If you if you look, they can't extend it past this top line. If, it, if they took this any further out, then they would be cutting into this chamfer and you would end up seeing a cutaway and end up being a divot. And so it, it, it limits how far they can pull this out. But the result is that the, the material that's left here is just longer than it um, thicker than it would be otherwise. So on the Dawn in particular, this material right here is 42 thousandths thick. And the end result, if you measure from the, the bottom of these two crests, so I'm not being silly and measuring from the very top, this is uh, 62 thousandths. So that's a 47% increase in how thick this material is. And the result is that if you compare these two, because this is a thicker amount of material right here and they haven't changed anything else, this is really easy to push over. And this is just meaningfully less flexible. This is just a lot firmer and stiffer of a lock bar. And it's not about where do they bend the lock bar to, it's about how flexible it is itself. Now, what can they do about this? And what can Kevin do about this? The, the correct way to compensate this, the best thing you can do, since you can't make this any thinner, is to extend the length of the lock bar. The whole reason why they chose this length in the first place is that uh, materials, like the, the, it's able to be a spring because there's some flexibility to it. And the longer you have the bar, the more flexibility there is because the more length there is. And so what they can do to compensate for the fact that this is now as a result, a stiffer lock bar than it would be otherwise, is pull this a little bit further back. Now I'm I'm not a knife maker. I don't have years of experience knowing what the impact of a little bit distance is. So I don't know how much further to pull it back, but they should pull it some back because the end result right now is that this is just stiffer than I want it to be. You have more, it's not hard at all to push this over, but there's just more pressure than I want it to be. And you can feel it as it goes. It's not hard to open and close this knife, but you can feel that additional pressure. And that would that would go away if they made this lock bar a little bit longer. So that's a good segue into getting into action. So this knife, this knife has both a front flipper and a hole, and they're both really, really well designed. The hole, 
oh, it flicks so incredibly well. You can flick it with the meat of your finger at the top. You can flick it with the meat of the finger at the bottom. You can use the nail of your finger. It just works fantastically. You can also use the side of your finger. Like all of these, it works so well. I'm someone that is usually pretty bad. Yeah, I'm gonna show you right there. I'm usually pretty bad at thumb flicking whole knives, but this one is actually really, really easy to do. And it has to do with the positioning of this hole relative to the handle. Everything is in pretty far. And so you have the ability to flick upward rather than outward a lot more easily. But then there's the curves here. Like you're not gonna run into any portion of the handle as you're going. And so you can flick, like I said, up and just kind of follow this line and it works really, really well. Sometimes you can have to flick out and you can do that on this knife too, but you don't have to. And I just, oh, I love how easy it is to flick this knife. I also really, really love the sound it makes. Let me try and do that up to mic. So what's going on here is we have a, a carbon fiber overlay right up here at the front. And so when this hits into the stop pin, it is, by the way, an internal stop pin that's traveling through a smile shaped arc cut into the handle. When this hits the stop pin and when this lock bar clicks over into place, there's now a pocket of air right here where the lock bar used to be. And so that pocket of air becomes an echo chamber and it gives you this wonderful echo thick click that you just don't find in other knives like this. Oh, I love the sound as it snaps into place. It's so good. Now the other opening mechanism like we talked about is the front flipper and it works really, really well. He's gone out of his way to extend the jimping all the way around the top, which means you don't lose traction even if you grip slightly higher up. I love to see that, that's fantastic. He purposely recessed this further back so that it wouldn't stick out from the front and so it's not gonna be the kind of thing that is like a weird mohawk at the front of a knife. I think it looks really, really nice. Now, one of the things that he said that he was hoping for is to have this be more rounded and in their implementation, it ended up being more like a 90 degree angle with just the corner rounded. I do like the version he had in his sketch better with a slightly more rounding there, but this still works really, really nicely. By having it recessed, but having it the, the entire knife part slope back here means you get to do the thing. I, this is one of my biggest complaints about uh, front flipper design is that people usually uh, have it flush with the front in a way that you have to flick up and out and rather instead of just up and back. And so this, if you, if you follow the path that you go, you're able to push directly upward and have follow through and it works so much better as a result. Oh, it's so good. My hand just kind of hit that right there. So now I mentioned when talking about the front flipper that I was going to mention this clip. Now on a front flipper, like here, like uh, so the, the, the Dawn, for example, is doing that same thing. It allows you to just do back. Uh, you know, push up and back, but it's doing it by pulling the front flipper even out further. But anyway, when you're holding under a front flipper, you have to balance the knife in your hand. You have to kind of grip it in this otter grip that is not the best for people with limited dexterity, but it's also not the best for people that are just not used to it. Rather than being able to brace the knife in your hand in a more like secure way on like a regular flipper or with a thumb stud, you're having to grip it in the front in this kind of weird way. And the average way, the way that most people, the way that I always do it is by using the clip to kind of pull it back into my hand. But this only works if the ratio of the knife to the hand is putting the top where your thumb needs to be while you're still on that clip. And if you look at the size of this from my hands, there's just so much more handle sticking up there. And so I find that I, in order to be up the top enough that I'm able to have the, the torque and position, everything that my thumb needs to be, I have way less ability to grip this clip. I'm really only gripping the clip with just my pinky finger. So if you have bigger hands, this won't be a problem for you at all. You'll be able to come down here. But for me, this handle is just a little bit bigger than I want for mine. And so what I'm finding is that sometimes, because I'm not able to grip it quite out like this, I end up gripping it a little bit too much like that. And so sometimes I accidentally hit it into my palm. And so that's something you saw just a moment ago. I hit it slightly like that as I was going. But that's not going to be a problem if your hands are as big as you would as you would expect for someone who's in the target audience for this knife. But it still works really, really well even uh, with my slightly smaller hands. Now, one of the things I talked about with this lock bar is that the it's it's just a bit stiff. And so from my personal preferences, I think the detent strength is a little bit firmer than I would want for a front flipper. I have to push on this kind of hard. And the side effect is that I find this, I find that hard to do. It's just too firm of a lock bar pressure from for me to be able to do this easily. I can kind of get it done, but it's, it's hard to do it 
easily. But one of the things that makes it possible at all for me is the way that this reverse bolster lock is working. A problem with front flippers in general is that you have to be able to grip the knife in this kind of weird way where you don't have a whole lot of touch points on the knife and then be able to pull up and back. And what that usually means, if you look at the where your hand falls in the back side of the knife, is trying to run down this spot here, but avoid this lock bar. And I think the Dawn does a really nice job of having a narrow lock bar and a lot of handle. And so I think this is a super duper easy knife to do that on. But on a lot of knives, it's really hard to keep your fingers off this lock bar. And if you are putting any pressure on the lock bar, it usually means the detent strength is just too strong to be able to do it in any kind of graceful way. And then you have a lot of chance of this flying out of your hand. Now over here, by having having this, this overlay cover up the lock bar entirely, the whole reason why I'm able to do this at all is because I have, I can put my finger literally anywhere. I can even put two fingers back here. I can grip it like this and put both fingers because I have full access and it, it makes it kind of possible. But the other reason why I'm struggling with this is because it's just thicker in this dimension than my hands are meant for. My fingers just aren't quite long enough to wrap around this. And I work it, front flippers, like the reach around it works so much better for me and my hands if the overall knife is just a little bit thinner. So I don't, I don't personally, there, it's probably the best version I've done on camera so far. I don't personally do that with this knife in the time that I've had it, but this up here works really, really nicely. I do find that it starts wearing on my finger a little bit because of how firm the detent is, but it's not actually problematic. And the thing is, is this detent strength works so good for that. So good, it just flies out, I love it. Now, one thing that you've seen is that this knife is just a dream to close. Partly what's going on here is that this is just a big enough, heavy enough blade, and because of this very pronounced cutout, the center of mass of the blade is quite far forward, and so it means it just wants to go home. But this is my favorite kind of closing action where it isn't a guillotine. I know a lot of people love that, but I don't. I don't, I mean, I think it's impressive when you have it and it's kind of fun, but it's not my favorite for a knife I'm actually gonna use on a regular basis because then it's kind of, you have to be paying attention to those. You know, it's a little bit dangerous. You have to be thinking about what you're doing when you're closing or else it might cut your finger. And with this, I, it's so easy to close this and then it's gonna stay exactly where you put it, but any amount of trying to close it and it just swings home. It's got, it's the kind of knife where you can just kind of like, hey, doing this under cameras is hard to do, but it's the kind of knife you can just kind of pull it backward and it's gonna close. Yeah, that kind of thing. Oh, it's great. And just the tiniest little micro jiggles and this thing wants to fall home. So I, oh, I love playing with this knife. It is so easy to flick and so easy and seamless to close that it's, it's a dream to fidget with. But more importantly, in a usage situation, you can so easily get this open, do what you need to do, not have to worry about having it cut off your thumb, and then just try and go like that. It's so easy to close. I love it, I love it, I love it, I love it. If they were to lighten this lock bar strength, then this might actually be a true fall from its own weight knife. I don't know how I feel about that. I, I'm not sure if it really would be enough to do that. Well, now, one thing about closing is that the detent angle here is good, but not spectacular. This, we're talking about how far do you have to close the knife before you hit this detent ball. And so thus, how much you have to get past that point and be able to get up on the detent ball and be able to do that, that kind of closing that I'm talking about. Behind that, it's just gonna bounce on that detent ball. And this right here is 14 degrees. Now, that's better than the industry average. The industry average for a long time has been up around 20, but I think that's actually getting better, especially as brands like Civivi are pulling it down to eight or nine degrees on a consistent basis. So I would love to see this be a little bit further up like that. And the way that they would accomplish that is by moving this detent ball a little bit further out. So you can see, or and also further up, uh, is there any light in that? Can I bounce up enough light to be able to see in here? Eh. Maybe, let me get a flashlight. Yeah, okay, there we go. Unfortunately, I now can't use my little pointy stick, but you can see where the location of that D10 ball is. And what I would want to see them do is pull it a little bit further forward in this direction and a little bit further out in this direction. But I'm a little bit concerned about them pulling it further out. If they pull it further out, what that's gonna do is increase the lever arm distance of that detent ball, and it's gonna increase the strength of the detent ball. So I don't want them to pull it further out unless they're also going to lighten this lock bar pressure by moving this further back, like I suggested. But if they keep it where it is, moving it further forward, both of those things will have the impact of making this blade hit the detent ball a little bit earlier. Now, I don't find it to be a huge problem this knife because 14 degrees is enough that I can very easily close this 
and be past that D10 ball. I don't, I, I, I think this is like a, a, a very nitpicky last mile concern kind of thing, but I do mention it because this knife is not a knife that nicely falls to your thumb. Uh, knives that cleanly follow your thumb in a way that's not going to risk cutting you, then I don't care about that almost at all because I can just make it fall to my thumb. You can see what happens though if it falls to my thumb. There's no spot that isn't the blade that's going to make contact. And it is right now this kind of sharp tip. Now, if they do make the change that I referenced earlier and, and knock this top, this last bit off so that it is not quite as sharp there, maybe you could have that hit your thumb and not be a problem. Also with the lock bar strength it is, if you could kind of get used to not completely pushing it over, but just letting it fall gently in your thumb, it's not a big deal. But if you completely push this over and let it just free fall to your thumb, well, there's a lot of weight to this blade that's gonna come and hit your nail right there. And especially if you then, if you're the type of person that holds your thumb like this, and then it came down on your finger, oof, that would be problematic. Now, when it comes to pushing this over, this bolster is acting as a fundamental over travel stop, of course, but there actually is an over travel stop at the bottom of this as well that extends out right there. And so you have no risk whatsoever of over bending this lock bar. As a result, it's not hard to push this quite firmly and have this just free fall. And so that's all the more reason why I would like to see that detent ball slightly positioned differently so that you're not having to try to make it fall your thumb. If you do it at an angle, I'm doing this under camera. Normally I would be doing it at this kind of spot, but if you do it at an angle like that, that's the other way of doing it is because if it doesn't have enough momentum, if it's falling at this, like, I don't know, just ever so slightly off of flat, and then it will fall to your thumb in a little bit easier way. But overall, I think this knife is a dream to close and even more of a dream to open. I love flicking this knife. It works, so, oh man, I suck at that. I don't know why I always try to do that, but it works so well for all of those different options. Everything is just positioned in a really, really delightful place. And it just, oh, I love it. I love it, I love it, I love it. So what are my final thoughts on this knife? <clears throat> the short version is that, man, I, I want him to make a mini. And in fact, he's planning to. I don't, I don't know if it's gonna happen. It's not guaranteed yet, but assuming that the sales on this go decently, he actually is planning on doing a second run in a smaller size. And his, his idea for that right now is 3.25 inches. I think that's the Goldilocks. And if I'm, if I'm being completely honest, I think he should lead with that because he has a new brand. And I think at this size, he might have difficulty convincing people to, to buy in on a 3.6 inch knife. And a 3.25 inch knife, I think he would have an easier time selling. That's the sweet spot for a lot of people. And I think that what, what you'd have a, probably a better chance of establishing it, getting these out into people's hands, getting people experiencing how good this knife is, and then being able to win over people on a slightly bigger version. That's, that's how I would do it. I would do it in the opposite order, but that's not what he's doing. You know, like all first time designers making an OEM knife, they're, they're making their dream. Well, not all. Some are making just something purely practical, but people like Kevin are trying to make their dream knife. They're having their ideal knife manifest into existence. And as a result, he likes bigger knives and he wanted his first knife to be his dream knife. And so, yeah, I, I, I personally probably won't be buying one of these. And it's not because I don't love it. I love this knife. It's just because I know, having played with this for two full weeks now, that every time I pick it up, it just feels too big for my hands for what I want. I could get used to it. I'm sure I could, because the reality is this feels so dang good in my hands. Even in my hand size, this feels so dang good. And it did work so well as a cutter. Everything about this worked so nicely that I'm sure I could get used to it and I'm sure I would love it. But I have so many knives that fit my hands perfectly that this one consistently felt a little bit too big for me. But if you love this and if you don't want to wait, or if you just don't trust that there will be a, a, a 3.25 inch one down the line, who knows, um, then I highly recommend that you get on this. If you're someone that likes bigger knives to begin with, like if I know I have a lot of friends that like, we, you know, we have a, a lot of aesthetic similarities, but I like tiny knives and they love huge knives. If you like bigger knives, oh my God, you have to get on this. This is such a good version of a bigger knife. I like yeah. And if you're, if you are in my camp and if you think you can tolerate a larger knife than you're used to, yeah, seriously, this just melts in your hand. I love the way this feels. So the pre-order for this is going to be in mid-September. I, I think that you should, oh, pricing on it. Yeah. That's the other thing. The micarta version is going to be $270 and the carbon fiber version of these is going to be 280 And I think that's putting it at right, the right price point. That's putting it at high enough that I know people will have to 
like they're going to have to save up some for some people or they're going to have to treat it as a serious offer. But this is a serious offer. This is a knife worthy of that price, but it's low enough because a lot of these kind of designery ones are up in the three, 300, 350, even 375 or above, especially you get into the larger sizes. I think that makes it a really quite competitive offer in that size point. And so, yeah, I think QSP did a fantastic job in the production of this. I think it feels really, really nice. I think the overall action on this is superb. And I think for that price point, I think you'll be very, very happy with it. Um, the best way that you can figure out more about this is by going to his websites, calenbladedesigns.com. You can sign up for his mailing list. You can also subscribe to him on Instagram, but yeah, definitely sign up for that mailing list. And that way is the easiest way to find out when the pre-order is going to start. I think it's going to be mid to late September and it's going to be a full pre-order. It's not going to be like a Kickstarter or something like that. Um, I, I really, really hope that works out for him because this, he deserves it. This knife is fantastic. The design is fantastic and he's just such a cool guy. I think you guys should try and support him. So thank you guys for watching. Thank you, Kevin, for letting me check this out. I'm going to send this off to Jared Neves after this. And you can also find reviews already on Left EDC and Skeleton Blade Works on their channels. There's a lot, a lot of good content that's going to be coming up because this is going to be, these are going to be passed around to a bunch of different channels. Yeah, huge, huge thank you to Kevin for letting me check this out early and for just in general letting me nerd out with you about this. I've had such a fun time. Everyone, thanks for watching and I'll catch you guys next time.